Putrescine and cadaverine are nasty smelling organic compounds that contribute heavily to the smell of rotting flesh. Both are produced during the breakdown of amino acids, which are the chemical building blocks of proteins. Putrescine comes from the breakdown of the amino acid ornithine, and cadaverine comes from lysine. What might be interesting to know is that these two nasty smelling amines are not only produced during putrefaction. They also contribute to other wonderful things like the stench of bad breath or bacterial vaginosis, as well as the characteristic smell of semen. In the past, I've made both by thermal decarboxylation, but today I'll be doing a proper chemical decarboxylation. I decided that I'd only make one of them though because the process is pretty much the same for both, and I chose cadaverine because I had the precursor on hand. When we take a look at the chemicals, it's probably the most ingredients I've ever used in a reaction. I was going to read out all of the ingredients, but I feel like I'd put you to sleep if I read each one. I adapted the procedure that I'm using from a paper, and I'll provide a link to it in the description. The first thing that I need to do is prepare a buffer solution, and I start by adding 3.2 grams of disodium phosphate dodecahydrate to a flask. I then add in about 0.6 grams of citric acid and 90 milliliters of distilled water. I drop in a stir bar and I mix things until everything has fully dissolved. In chemistry, a buffer solution is a solution that resists pH change. The buffer here has a pH around 5, and if a small amount or even a moderate amount of acid or base is added, the pH shouldn't change very much. This is really useful for pH sensitive reactions, and it allows us to keep a nearly constant pH throughout the entire process. According to the paper that I got this procedure from, a pH of 5 was extremely important. When they didn't use a buffer and the pH was allowed to change, they found that the reaction actually took a different pathway and led to the wrong product. Anyway, just for fun, I used a universal pH strip to verify that we had a pH of about 5. To the nice and freshly prepared buffer solution, I add 3.53 grams of L-lysine. The stirring is turned on, and I let things mix until all of the lysine has dissolved. While the lysine solution is being stirred, we can move on and make our second solution. To do this, we start by adding 20 milliliters of dimethylformamide, also known as DMF. Into the DMF, we add 10.3 grams of N-bromosuccinamide, or NBS for short. The mixture is stirred until we're left with a clear solution and all of the NBS has dissolved. The NBS solution is then added slowly to our buffer solution. You can see that CO2 is being evolved very shortly after the solution is added. What's going on here is an NBS-induced oxidative decarboxylation of an amino acid. This is the overall reaction that we're doing here, where we're converting the amino acid to the corresponding nitrile. According to the paper, this is the step that the pH buffer was important for, because if the pH wasn't controlled and kept around 5, it would produce an aldehyde instead of our desired nitrile. The procedure in the paper didn't say anything about adding it slowly, and I just chose to do this, but as I was editing and I reread the paper, there was a mention in the introduction that they added the NBS solution dropwise. If the NBS solution is added too quickly, it might start reacting before it can be adequately mixed with the buffer. This might cause some areas of the solution and some parts of the reaction to fluctuate from a pH of 5, and this could possibly lead to the wrong product and reduce our yield. This is just speculation on my part though, and I don't really have any way to verify whether this happened or not. Anyway, after all the NBS solution is added, I let things stir until there's no more bubbling. I think it took something like 5 minutes for the bubbling to stop, but the paper said to stir things for 30 minutes, so that's what I did. After the 30 minutes, I dumped in 22.9 grams of nickel chloride hexahydrate. This is allowed to stir until everything dissolves. 
You'll notice here that I messed up a little bit and some of the nickel chloride didn't make it into the flask, but that really shouldn't be a problem. I weighed out 5.84 grams of sodium borohydride and I started to add it in small portions. It's really important to add it slowly because the reaction is quite vigorous. Also, it produces a lot of hydrogen gas, so it's important to do this in a well ventilated area. Okay, so what's going on here is we're reducing the nitrile that we made in the previous step to the corresponding amine. In solution, the sodium borohydride will combine with the nickel chloride to make nickel boride. Under normal conditions, sodium borohydride does not reduce nitriles. However, in the presence of a catalyst like nickel boride, the reaction actually proceeds quite readily. The solution is originally very dark because we have a high concentration of nickel chloride, but as we add the sodium borohydride, we use up the nickel chloride and the solution lightens up. However, as we continue with the addition, we produce more nickel boride, which is a black solid, and the solution gets dark again. As we continue to add more sodium borohydride, each addition becomes less and less vigorous. Because of this, we can start to add much larger portions, and we don't have to fear some crazy violent reaction. Once I've finished adding all of the sodium borohydride, I continue to stir the solution for about 20 minutes. What we need to do next is separate the black nickel boride solid from the reaction solution. This can be a pretty big pain because the nickel boride that formed is extremely finely dispersed. I tried to do a gravity filtration here through some cotton and it clearly fails. The best way that I found to separate it was by vacuum filtration where I pulled it through I think two or three filter papers. The first filtration is still going to be full of nickel boride and to clear things up we're going to have to do a second filtration. Once everything has come through, I transfer everything in the filtration flask back to the beaker and I pour it through the same filter paper. Although the solution looks the same, a lot of the solid was actually trapped by the filter paper. The solid nickel boride that was trapped by the filter paper will actually itself act as a filter. So this time when we filter things through, we have a nice clear solution that's pretty much free of nickel boride. When I take off the filter here, you can see all of the nickel boride that's been trapped. I dropped a stir bar into the flask and then I basified the solution. The goal here is to get the pH of the solution around 11 to 12 so that we can liberate free base cadaverine. Before we basify things, there's actually no smell because cadaverine is still in its salt form, cadaverine hydrochloride. By increasing the pH, we're converting the cadaverine hydrochloride to its free base form, which is going to stink a little. Some of the sodium hydroxide is also going to react with some of the nickel that's present, and it will form nickel hydroxide, which will precipitate out of solution. The pH was verified using universal pH papers, so once we reached a pH of around 11 to 12, I stopped adding sodium hydroxide. Everything was transferred to a separatory funnel, and it's time to extract our cadaverine. In theory, I could have filtered off all the nickel salt that formed, but there's honestly really no point. The cadaverine solution was extracted three times using 30 milliliters of diethyl ether each time. The typical procedure is that we add the extraction solvent, we cap, shake, and vent the separatory funnel, and then we place it back on the stand for the layers to separate. Once the layers have separated, the lower aqueous layer is drained off, and we collect the upper ether layer in a beaker. This process is repeated two more times for a total of three washings. The combined ether washings are poured back into a clean separatory funnel, and then I pour in some saturated salt solution. This step is somewhat optional, and it's mostly just used to dry the ether and pull out any water that might be dissolved in it. The aqueous layer was drained off, and our upper ether layer was poured into an Erlenmeyer flask. Just to get rid of the last water that might remain, 
the diethyl ether was dried using a little bit of magnesium sulfate. The magnesium sulfate was then separated from the diethyl ether by filtering it through a little bit of cotton. Diethyl ether is extremely volatile, so I just let it evaporate at room temperature. Once all the ether was gone, I was left with a nice gooey residue at the bottom of the beaker. Cadaverian has a melting point of around 9C, so it makes sense that we're left with a goo and not a solid. With a little bit of skill, the cadaverian was transferred from the beaker to a small vial. Cadaverin didn't seem to be super soluble in acetone, so I used a very small amount to try to get rid of any water that might remain. I added a little bit of acetone, mixed things around thoroughly, and then poured off the liquid. I then left the vial out for a bit for the acetone to evaporate. This might reduce the yield a little bit, but the cadaverin should be relatively water free and a little bit more pure. Okay, so I should really address the fact that the yield of this reaction is pretty miserable. The yield that I got was about 0.5 grams, and the theoretical is supposed to be about 2. In the paper that I followed, the yield that they got for cadaverin was 77%, which is actually more than triple what I got. I do have an explanation for this though, and it's pretty much because I poorly adapted the procedure from the paper. The solubility of amino acids can vary quite a bit, and the paper provided two procedures. The first procedure was for when the amino acid was very soluble in water, and the second one was for when it wasn't very soluble. Lysine hydrochloride is pretty soluble in water, and we need to use the first method. I tried using the second one, and it pretty much doesn't work at all. In the first procedure, after the nickel boride was filtered off, I was supposed to pass it through a Dowex ion exchange column. I didn't have the supplies to set up a column, so I opted to do an extraction like they did in the second procedure. This is a problem though, because cadaverin is quite soluble in water, so it's difficult to extract. According to the solubilities online, I don't have an exact number, but it's actually more soluble in water than it is diethyl ether and some other extraction solvents. This means that extracting it with an organic solvent is actually super inefficient, and we're probably leaving a lot of cadaverin behind in the water. I honestly thought I was maybe going to be able to get away with using the ether to extract it, but it clearly didn't work. I decided not to try to redo the prep, because I didn't really have a use for cadaverin anyway, and also, I ran out of diethyl ether. If I were to redo things, I still wouldn't use a Dowex column, but I would try two other things. One thing that I could try is saturate the solution with sodium chloride and reduce the solubility of the cadaverine, which might make its extraction a little bit better. I'm honestly not sure how well that would work, and I'd actually think this other idea might be better. Before any basification is done, I could simply evaporate off all of the water and leave behind cadaverine dihydrochloride as well as nickel salts. To the residue, I could then add a small amount of basified ethanol. This should freebase the cadaverin, which is soluble in ethanol, but it should leave behind the nickel salts. When the ethanol is evaporated, I should be left with the cadaverin and maybe some salts that were able to dissolve into the ethanol. The residue could then be washed with some ether, which would pick up the cadaverin and leave behind the salts. Then, when the ether is evaporated, it should contain just our cadaverine. Anyway, that's just an idea off the top of my head. I don't really know for sure if it would work, but I want to know what you guys think could be a viable way to do this. So that's more or less the question that I have for you guys in this video. Do you think my suggestions make sense and that they could be viable, or do you have any suggestions or ideas of your own? Also, I'm pretty much blaming my low yield on the solubility of cadaverin in water, but do you think this is accurate, or do you think there could be another reason why my yield is so much lower than the papers? As usual, I'd like to thank everyone who's supporting me on Patreon. Anyone who supports me with $5 or more will get their name at the end of the video like you see here. Eventually, I hope to get some higher tiers going, and also add some more rewards to the $1 and $5 tier. 
I also think I'll add some sort of voting system so that supporters can influence which videos I post next and the videos that I film next. So if you guys know of any good polling or voting websites, please let me know. Anyway, these are the videos that I've already filmed and the ones that I plan to film. If you have any suggestions, please let me know in the comments.